So uh, today we're going to continue uh, looking at some of these issues of reform early in American life and in, in particular the role that religion plays uh, in some of the reform movements, although not completely focused on religion today. Um, I mentioned yesterday that religion has had a diverse role in American history over our course of time in terms of sometimes it seems to be weighing in on the conservative side of things, sometimes it seems to be weighing in on the liberal side of things. Uh, here we get a little bit of a weighing in on what we might just call the crazy side of things. Um, and this happens periodically um, across cultures, across religious backgrounds, where you get a strain of millennialism. The end times are coming. Okay, You see these people sometimes on the streets of American, uh, major American cities with the sandwich boards, walking around. But we had an element of that here, and this poster shows some of the really complicated calculations that went on in predicting that the world was going to end in 1843, or maybe 1844. So, spoiler alert, it didn't end. Okay, otherwise, you know, you wouldn't have to worry about your homework for tonight. Um, now, this group of people, they were under the leadership of William Miller. They were known primarily then at this time as the Millerites. And through this calculated formula, came to the conclusion that the second coming, end of the world, was at some point between March 21st of 1843 and March 21st of 1844. Um, at times, they had more specific dates in mind than that. It was based upon certain prophecies that they found in the Bible. And a fair number of people were drawn to this. Um, and it's not really surprising. We had sort of a secular millennialism kind of happen to us around the year 2000. The whole Y2K thing. Planes were going to fall from the sky. The electricity wouldn't work anymore. Um, all of these terrible things that were going to happen, and, and of course they didn't. Um, so it's not too surprising to say that there was a fair number of people drawn to this. Of course, when it didn't happen, and they met on the mountaintop a couple of times, expecting the end, uh, it came to be known as the Great Disappointment. Uh, <laughs> but the Millerites didn't disappear. They kind of transformed themselves, and they became what we know today as the Seventh-day Adventists. Um, they were ridiculed more than a little bit uh, in the New England area, so they relocated to Battle Creek, Michigan. So the Millerites become the Seventh-day Adventists with their home base in Battle Creek, continued to attract uh, followers, um, one of them, W.K. Kellogg. Um, who was interested in all kinds of the health fads of the era, and part of the motivation behind cereal, uh, it's the, you know, we're talking cornflakes and, and things like that here, part of what lie behind that, uh, like the graham cracker, um, was this notion that this food was supposed to be more morally wholesome in a way. I think it might be something like associating spicy food and spicy behavior kind of thinking that's going on here. And they were kind of worried um, that, there was, that there were going to be some problems. So this notion of food being something that could be um, adjusted and to adjust people's morality was important to them as well. Speaking of adjustments, I'm going to make one here. I'm sure this is going to sound great on the tape, but I'm noticing a little bit of a red light on the device that might be my sound is coming in a little hot. Um, anyways, so the, the Millerites, Seventh-day Adventists, um, and uh, that, that group continues on. Another organization, this one unique because it was led by a woman, uh, Mother Ann Lee, uh, was the Shakers. Um, they had a longer more official name. They were known as the Shakers. It's interesting how this happens sometimes where what is an insult becomes a moniker that people adopt. Um, Huey Long was called the Kingfish when he was the governor of Louisiana. It was meant to be an insult uh, based upon a character in a radio show and he said, no, I kind of like that, so he, the Kingfish became what it was. Um, reformers around the turn of the century 
were called muckrakers by Theodore Roosevelt. It wasn't a kind thing to say. They looked always down at the muck and never saw the beauty of the sky. But they adopted that term, and it became how they knew themselves. The Shakers, a little bit like that. I don't think it was meant to be terribly insulting. Um, but they were thought of as shaking Quakers because they danced. Um, dancing was a key part of what they did. It was uh, not the sort of some kind of ecstatic dancing that you might see with some, uh, some group today. But instead, <coughs> it was um, the kind of dancing that was, I guess, like line dancing today. You might see it in a country western line dancing or square dancing. Or even when I've been to some of the homecoming dances, there are certain songs, I don't know them, but everybody gets up and they all do the dance together, right? See that happen every year at homecoming or whatever. So the Shakers had this dancing. Um, and what's important to understand about the Shakers is that they were believers in the beauty of simplicity. And they believed that doing things beautifully reflected on the person and reflected on their devotion to God. So that's how they lived them, their lives. They, the, a slogan of the Shakers that you would see embroidered at times and engraved on things was uh, hands to work, hearts to God. Through one's hard work and through work well done, one was demonstrating uh, one's religious faith. Okay, And that's something that they very much believed in. So the Shakers um, also had some unique characteristics of utopian society, complete celibacy. Both men and women were there, but they didn't interact with each other, and at least not in the kind of way that would make any babies. So that meant to get more Shakers, you had to recruit. People had to come into the Shaker the community from the outside. Now, some people took a little bit of advantage of that, um, when the winter would get bad and they would run out of food, there were these people that they, even the Shakers referred to them as winter Shakers. Uh, they would only be there for the hard times and they would leave in the spring. But their doors were open. They had babies dropped off at their doorstep. And that's not just a metaphor or um, allegorical kind of thing that, that we hear about happening in stories. It literally did happen. And it did happen with the Shakers. Some children grew up there. Many of those children, when they reached an age of where they could go out and work, they left. And, but people came in. I have not been able to find recently, I've looked, uh, in, the, in the 90s, I know there were still a handful of Shaker women around. They were still living in a community out east. Um, I've had trouble tracking if they have all passed. They were elderly, and so I don't know if we still have Shakers or not, but it does tell us something that from the early 1800s into the late 1900s, this community persisted. So it does say something about, about who they were and what they did. Um, they did a lot of, well, let's go to the dancing thing first. Uh, this drawing here was done by somebody probably seeing a group of former Shakers do a demonstration for money. That was something that happened. There was an interest, there was a sort of a curiosity about the Shakers. This is not a particularly good drawing. Um, it looks a little bit like um, Thriller, maybe. Um, a little bit like maybe it's out of one of the zombie shows. Um, this poor little guy here, <laughs> not quite sure what to make of him. And the guy he's standing next to looks absolutely horrifying. So anyways, but it is meant to show that when the Shakers danced, they danced in unison. And when they did their dancing, it, kept, it was very much in keeping with the messages of their music. So... Here's a song that some of you may have heard, but it is a gift to be simple, it is a gift to be free. Sometimes we become enslaved to our possessions. A lot of young people your age, you don't own cars, your cars own you. You work for your car. You have to generate enough revenue to keep your car on the road. If you didn't have the car, you wouldn't need the job. Okay? 
and they, the, they just have that relationship of where the ownership is not quite so clear. Um, and so to give to come down, so imagine they're moving down at this point, probably ducking or, or, or bending knees uh, to talk about where they are. The next, they bow and they bend, and not to be ashamed, and then turn, turn um, once again. And they would do these kinds of things in their dancing with their songs. It's much more meditative than one might think. It's rather like a moving meditation, okay, that was accompanied by some music. Um, and it's, that, that is a, something that was what they were well known for. Um, again, the beauty, the utility, um, shaker furniture still made today in the shaker style. With the ladder back chairs, you see the weaving that was done with, for baskets and for the chair seats. The pegs along the wall to hang things. If you look back here at the, at the uh, work uh, with the uh, dancing, you see their hats hanging on pegs on the wall, but they would also hang the furniture up on the wall to get it out of the way if they were having gatherings or dancing or whatever might be going on. You see a shaker post bed there with the fine turnings at the top. That's that hands-to-work, hearts-to-God mentality. Um, the next photo, you see a, a couple of things here. The, the room would be divided between the men's side and the women's side. Um, so you would have center aisles that, that divided the genders. They had different stairways, stairways that is, in their, in their buildings. So men lived on one side of the building, women on the other side. They even used separate stairwells. Um, this building that you see in the lower left of the page, I suspect that's a renovation because it has a door in the center. Um, the Shaker uh, buildings had two doors. Uh, again, one for the men to enter, one for the women to enter. So the Shakers were one of these utopian societies that persisted for quite some period of time. Stepping away from religion directly a little bit, would be to look at the transcendentalists. A couple of things that we have to get clear on the transcendentalists, their use of words a little bit different than ours. When they talk about reason, it's different than the way we talk about reason. For us, reason is kind of hard, cold logic. It's what happens in the courtroom. It, it's the notion of intellectual pursuit. And not surprisingly, given their name, they wanted to transcend that kind of understanding of reason. So for them, reason also included sort of an innate and intuitive nature, ability that is, to grasp the truth of things, to see the beauty in things. Um, and so instinct and emotion was an, an important part of the reason of the transcendentalist. So their goal was to rise above what they thought of as mere understanding, which was just the intellectual part, and to get to this more transcendent level to allow the individual to flourish. A couple of key individuals from this period of time that you run across in your textbook, and I won't go into a lot of detail uh, in terms of their work. I'll let the, the book speak for itself. But Ralph Waldo Emerson, he was the star of this era, of this movement. He... Um, had been a, a minister, became uncomfortable uh, in, in that role, probably similar to the deists that we read about and talked about in, earlier in American life. So he resigned uh, from the pulpit and became a writer and a speaker. That's how he made his living, as a writer and a speaker, um, and did quite well, actually. And uh, some of his most famous works are, are there listed. He is also known as a poet. Uh, he's the, the person that wrote that poem about the shot heard around the world. So another individual, um, different, very different from Ralph Waldo Emerson. Some people say, and I think it's a little unfair, that they'll say, well, you know, um, Emerson was sort of the philosophical transcendentalist, but, but Henry David Thoreau was the real thing. Um, I don't think that's a, a completely fair 
characterization really of either of them, or completely accurate at least. Henry David Thoreau, most famous of course for going to live at Walden Pond. Um, that was his independence. For him, a utopia was just himself, apparently. Um, he had uh, three chairs. Two chairs were so he could have when he had company, and three chairs was for society. That was a pretty big gathering for Henry David Thoreau to have three people in the room. Um, once you see his house, you'll understand why. But uh, also famous for his work on civil disobedience. Um, interesting thing about that, all told, that episode is almost a silly little episode. Henry David Thoreau refused to pay his poll tax because he believed it went to a government that was fighting a war for slavery in the Mexican War, which we'll talk about in the next unit. So he wouldn't pay. <clears throat> well, his aunt paid for him, but he didn't know it. And neither did the police officer that arrested him. So they take him to jail, and he sits in jail, and, and he thinks about things. This, you know, the, the, I think it's more apocryphal, this notion of him actually writing civil disobedience while sitting in jail. He may have wrote some things down. He may have not written of anything. He may not have had anything to write with when he got there. We, I don't know for sure. But the sheriff in town, um, who lived in a house that was not long ago just uh, renovated by this old house folks on, on PBS, the sheriff knew that Thoreau's tax had been paid, but just didn't want to be bothered to go get him. So Henry David Thoreau sits in jail overnight for no real reason. Um, but out of that comes this notion of civil disobedience. Um, and the idea here that's very important is, is the resonation that this has around the world. Others have picked this up. Gandhi picks up this idea. Um, uh, Dr. King picks up this idea. Uh, and others who have tried to create change have adopted notions of civil disobedience. Given some of the things that have been going on recently in response to what happened in Ferguson, there are some people who could do well to read this and also to read some history about how people like Gandhi and Dr. King created the change they wanted to see in the world. Um, and, and none of which had to do with uh, burning down buildings um, or looting. So the transcendentalist key idea is there's a basic unity in all creation between people, between nature, and nature is really the emblem of spiritual reality for these folks. In fact, nature is like a church. Okay, Rather than go to a church, you go into nature, there's where you're going to find God. So nature has this sort of religious and spiritual meaning behind it. And to understand the truths of life, the belief was you had to go out into nature. That you were going to have to sort of deal with that. Not like a scientist. I don't think they necessarily would have been opposed to scientists, but they, that that's not how they were viewing the world. Okay, They were not going to explain the changes of the seasons um, by doing all kinds of calculations about daylight and temperature and chlorophyll compositions and so forth. Um, they were going to instead focus in on what it meant at a deeper level. Okay, So that's why Henry David Thoreau moves to Walden. This is a replica of his house, um, such as it is in Walden, very small. Um, when I stood inside that structure, I couldn't quite reach both walls, but it wasn't a long ways off, okay? So uh, from side to side. Um, this is not the original, obviously. It's also not the original site. Um, when they put this replica up, the, the site was unknown of where he had actually had his structure. Um, this is a view from the other side, very simple, windows on each side. Get some cross ventilation, get some light uh, into the structure. Um, the heat, of course, and, and the cooking all would happen here um, at his uh, stove. That would uh, this, and then the uh, the chimney was on the back wall, not pictured in the other. Well, I guess you could probably see it, the chimney there in the back. 
So his entire living space, this is pretty much it. I took this picture right from the doorway. So that, there you have it. Okay, and that's why three chairs was society because there's not much room beyond that in this, in this structure. Had the desk where he could sit and look out the window and do some of his writing, he began taking the notes that he, that he later turns into Walden. Okay, the, the book. There were other things from his previous writing experiences that also found their way into Walden, but of course most of it is a reflection upon his, his life here. His, um, they did find the site of his cabin uh, some years uh, after they started using the, the replica site. And you can see today uh, where the cabin was and the size of it. Um, in the middle towards the back there you can see the hearth and the fireplace. Um, but the favorite, my favorite picture that I took while I was there is this one. This is standing where Henry David Thoreau's door would have been. This is what he would have seen when he woke up in the morning. So this is how he's able to get into the beauty of nature and try to understand some of the meanings of life. Um, so that as he wrote, I should not get to the end of my life and discover that I had not lived. And he was trying to, as he said again, front the essentials of life, to see what was most important and crucial. And for him, like the Shakers, it was simplicity. Here's a picture of, of the lake itself. No, that is not like a Loch Ness monster or a Walden Pond monster there. It's just somebody swimming across. It's, it's really a small lake as opposed to a pond, I think, is a better way of describing it to us. Um, small enough that people who were good swimmers and did this for exercise would swim back and forth across the pond. There's a trail that goes all the way around and, and takes you pretty, keeps you fairly close to the water. Uh, one interesting thing to me is at some one point you walk by the trail, or walking along the trail, you walk by the railway tracks that Henry David Thoreau complains about in Walden that they were beginning to put down, um, and that he saw was going to disturb the beauty of this of this location. Um, little did he know that the beauty of this location was much more nearly lost in more modern times by real estate developers. Um, Walden Pond was not a protected site. And people who wanted to put up strip malls and condos started buying up the land. And it took some locals um, and th who then organized more broadly, including people like Don Henley from the Eagles, to generate revenues to buy that land back from the developers so that Walden is what it continues to be today, which is a, a pretty widely visited place um, by even the locals. The people go there, go to the beach, um, and, and walk and enjoy the trails. And all you can tell the locals as you go along the trail, there are these little places where it's almost natural steps, where you can step on a tree root or a rock or whatever and get down into the water. And so they take their lawn chairs down there and they put them in the water. They have little things where their coolers will float and they can have sandwiches and drinks as they're sitting there in the water. Um, they take their children there to play. So it's actually a fairly well-visited place and not just by history nerds like me who drive from cold water to, to go see uh, what it was like. Um, so to me, going back to this place was, uh, was a, a, or going to this place, it was a very interesting uh, and, and I thought a very important experience for me. Um, there's a, a, out by the original site, there's a pile of rocks and people have been piling these rocks there. And there, my wife took a picture of me sitting there on those rocks kind of gazing out in the pond and it seemed a very fitting photo for what was transpiring in terms of what was going on inside of me when I was there. Yes ma'am? They figured it out through excavations and through some things that looking at notebooks and his writings they were able to narrow down the area and then with some gentle excavations they were able to find the foundation from where it was. In particular, the most telling part of the foundation that, they, that really got them started was the fireplace. You've got to have more heft there because you're going to sit this cast iron stove on it and so forth. So from there they discovered that, then they discovered the perimeter of it. So, but it, I, I wish I could remember the year. It was in the 1900s when this was well into the 1900s, as I recall, when it was, was finally discovered. 
So um, Walden, the book, uh, I haven't read it recently, but there was a long stretch where I read it every year. Um, but I have not read it now in a couple of years. So, so as I say, Henry David Thoreau's utopia lasted two years, two months, and two days. That's how long he was at Walden Pond. He went there on, Jan uh, on July 4th, and he stayed there for that length of time. Not clear 100% why that day, although choosing July 4th seemed to be his personal declaration of independence, why two years, two months, two days is not quite so clear about why he left. Utopian communities, though, most of them involve more than one person living in a pond. Um, you read about Brook Farm in your textbook. Um, and important thing to, sh to see about Brook Farm was this devotion to m manual labor to balance out leisure and intellectual pursuits. This notion that you had to have a balance was important to these, these people here. Um, Nathaniel Hawthorne was at Brook Farm for a while. Became very cynical about the experience and wrote very negatively about it because it did show, he did find that there was some tension. And it was a tension that existed in all of these communities over the demands for communal life versus the demands of the individualism that the transcendentalists seem to be all about. How do we make a community run and be relatively self-sufficient and have people follow rules when you have a whole bunch of Thoreaus living there? Okay? It's a difficult thing for these, for these groups. And you saw that here at Brook Farm, also the Oneida community, another one mentioned in your textbook. I like to bring this one up mostly because I don't want us to leave this reading thinking, oh, that this was like Woodstock you know, free love and stuff like that, because this was a community that did not uh, abide by traditional marriage. Um, it, it really wasn't um, quite so extreme as all of that. Uh, and in fact, many of their ideals were much more about trying to protect women um, than we might, we might give them credit for. So these utopian communities, as I said before, had conflict inside of them between the freedoms that they pursued individually, but also the demands of community life, and that's why most of them did not succeed. That's why the Shakers are rare. A utopian society where there are remnants of it well into the 20th century, and maybe even to the 21st if there are still some around, but I've not been able to confirm that. We're going to move on now.